Okay, cool. I'll just make them on the... Hello. Hello. Hi, Allison. Allison just... So let me put it back in uh, full screen. Oh yeah, good. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay good. I just wasn't hearing anything for a while. So. Okay, good. Thank you for all of those who are joining. I see a lot of people uh, joining on my uh, on my screen, so this is pretty exciting. Oops. Are you ready to get going, Felicity? Yeah, I am ready when you are. OK. Uh, I, one quick announcement uh, before I give the introduction. Um, so we're going to try to record this presentation. Um, so anyway, if, if you make any sounds or something, that, that'll be part of the recording. So I just want to um, warn everybody. Um, and we hope to eventually post this online on the High Energy Density Center's website um, so that people who have missed it can still watch it. Um, anyway, my name is Paul Grabowski. I am a physicist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and I would like to welcome you to the High Energy Density Science Center seminar series. I hope you're all staying safe and sane at home, and I'm happy you could join us for the second special family seminar. I'm also excited that we get to share some of the excellent work done by our staff scientists with this great community. It is especially important in these strange times for all of us to find connection and growth in community. This goal fits well with some of the center's main purposes of education and outreach. So I'm pleased to have with us here today, Dr. Felice Albert. Felice Albert is, is the deputy director of the center and a scientist in Livermore's National Mission Facility and Photon Science Directorate as well as the Joint High Energy Density Sciences Organization. Her areas of expertise include the generation and applications of novel sources of electrons, X-rays, and gamma rays through laser plasma interaction, laser wake field acceleration, and Compton scattering. She has conducted many experiments using high energy high intensity lasers at various facilities around the world. Dr. Allaire received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers in 2019 was awarded a 2016 Department of Energy Early Career Research Program Award to develop new X-ray sources for high energy density science experiments and leads several laboratory directed research and development projects at Livermore. She received the 2017 American Physical Society Department of Plasma Physics Catherine E. Weimer Award for Outstanding Contributions to Plasma Science Research and the 2017 Edward Faber Prize for Contributions to the Physics of Laser Produced Plasmas. She was selected by the American Physical Society is an outstanding referee in 2015. Dr. Bill joined Livermore in 2008 as a postdoctoral researcher in the Photon Science and Applications Program to work on nuclear resonance fluorescent experiments. She became a permanent member of the technical staff in 2010. 
She earned her PhD in physics in 2007 from Ecole Polytechnique in France, her master's in optics from the University of Central Florida in 2004, and her bachelor's in engineering from Ecole Nationale Supérieure de Physique de Marseille, France in 2003. She serves on many technical review panels, conference committees, and editorial boards, and is regularly involved in outreach activities for specialized audiences. She has received more than 70 referee publications and has given more than 35 invited talks at international conferences. She is a member of the International Committee of Ultra Intense Lasers, current chair of LaserNet US, and a senior member of OSA and a fellow of the American Physical Society. And I am pleased to welcome her and I'm looking forward to hearing her talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for the introduction. Uh, so before uh, I begin, can everybody uh, hear me okay? Yes? Okay. Um, I am very excited uh, to uh, get this opportunity to present to you a lecture that I gave uh, two years ago um, during a Science on Saturday series that uh, we organized with the laboratory. And so I will reprise that lecture today. This was prepared with a high school physics uh, teacher, Dan Burns from uh, Los Gatos High School. And uh, I got a lot of help also from Joanna Albala at Livermore to put this talk together. And so today I will talk to you about laser plasma accelerators and how we can use them to produce a novel type of X-ray light sources. So rightfully so, I'll just go straight into the outline and tell you a little bit more about what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, uh, we'll talk about what particle accelerators are and how do they work. I'll show you how we can make x-rays with particle accelerators and I'll explain what x-rays are and how they're made. Then I'll go on to what we do at Livermore and the research that uh, we undertake in this area. We're trying to make miniature particle accelerators. And for that, we use lasers and we use plasmas and we call them laser wake field accelerators. Then I'll show you how we can make x-rays with these laser wake field accelerators. And finally, I'll talk about some cool applications of these laser wake field accelerators. All right, everybody's ready. Let's go to, uh, to the talk. So first questions, what are particle accelerators? You've probably all heard that word and uh, probably you've seen some. We have a few at the lab. But the first thing we can say is that a particle accelerator is a big machine. So it's a big machine that accelerates particles. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, one that, uh, that is very famous is called the Large Hadron Collider or LHC. And it's near uh, Geneva in Switzerland. It's not very far from uh, one area that I grew up in in France, so that's why I picked that picture. And you can see on the bottom of the picture, there is an airport runway, it's the Geneva Airport. And the circle represents the size of this accelerator. It is 27 kilometers in circumference. It would take you a long time to go and run around this accelerator. And because I am from France, uh, I've used uh, an image to compare. This accelerator is about the size of a big city like Paris. So this is quite big. You cannot have a particle accelerator like this one in your living room. And what are they used for? Why do we have particle accelerators around? The first thing is they are used for fundamental discoveries. Uh, you can use them to discover new particles. So you take different particles, you accelerate them, you smash them together, and this allows you to discover new phenomena and new particles. You can use particle accelerators for medical applications. They're very common in hospital because they can be used to treat cancers 
or to image uh, bones or tumors. They're used a lot for industry. Uh, you can use them to process some material, to sanitize some materials. And then finally, they're used a lot in national security where they're very useful to radiograph or to inspect cargo containers entering the country. So particle accelerators, as their names say, use charged particles. So we'll go over what is a charged particles and how we can produce them in a particle accelerators. So charged particles come from elements that are around um, surrounding us. And so elements is uh, what constitutes ordinary matter around us. I'll give you a few example. You have water and water is composed of the elements hydrogen or oxygen. A the air that we're breathing is comprised primarily of the element oxygen or nitrogen, a carbon um, such as um, uh, diamonds, such as that uh, you have on rings, is uh, composed of um, the element carbon. Uh, the pipes that are around your houses to, um, to carry water uh, is made of copper. So these are different examples of elements. If you were to take a magnifying glass, and look closely at these elements, you could see that the smallest form of matter that retains the properties of the elements is an atom. So if we take an example, a one carat diamond, uh, that's about the size of an engagement ring, it's about 10 to the 22 carbon atoms. So that's one and 22 zeros behind it. So that's a lot of atoms that you have in a diamond. And so that's to say an atom is very small. So let's, let's take a closer look at what an atom is. So on the left hand side, this represents an atom. And an atom is composed of charged particles. So charged particles, there are three, um, there are two different charged particles in an atom and three different types of particles. The first ones are protons and neutrons. They're in the middle of the atom and constitute what we call the nucleus. A proton is a subatomic particle in the nucleus that has a positive charge. A neutron is a subatomic particle that has no charge. And around the nucleus, you have other particles that are lighter, that are gravitating around the nucleus. These are electrons. And these are subatomic particles that have negative charge. And in an atom, there is as many protons as there are electrons. And overall, an atom is neutral. So in a particle accelerator, these particles eventually will go up to the speed of light. And that's 300,000 uh, kilometers per second. So to give you an idea, that's about 10 million times the speed of a car on a freeway. So that's very, very fast. To understand a little bit more how they work, let's take a look at a particle accelerator that's very close to the lab. It's at Slack. So um, I'm going to play a video. So Slack is a, another national uh, accelerator laboratory. It's a national laboratory like Livermore. And um, it's located about 50 miles from Livermore. And it hosts one of the longest particle accelerators in the world. And it produces particles. And it uses the element copper to produce these particles. To produce these particles, we strip them away from a piece of copper using a laser. And all the little blue dots that you see right here are bursts of electrons, charged particles, that are extracted from that piece of copper and that go and travel through the machine. These electrons travel through different sections of the machine. So these are different uh, parts of the accelerator. 
uh, they go around a bunch of elements. And eventually, once these electrons have been pushed initially, they will be pushed through different sections of the accelerator uh, until they're eventually accelerated to a very high speed. Basically, they can go as fast as the speed of light uh, when they travel. And this takes about two miles for these particles to accelerate and gain all of their speed. So that's very long. All right. So hopefully now we've all um, uh, understood how particle accelerators uh, work and uh, what are their um, uh, how they how they work. And so we'll talk about what we can do with them. So one of one thing we can do is uh, make X-rays. So you've probably all heard about X-rays or seen X-rays. Um, X-rays is what doctors use to take pictures of your bones if you have a broken bone or uh, pictures of your teeth. And so I'll take, uh, I'll take you a little bit through uh, an explanation of how X-rays work and, and how we can make them. So X-rays are exactly like visible light, except that you cannot see them. So what do I mean by X-rays are like visible light? So light is made of what we call electromagnetic waves. So you've probably all taken a rock uh, in front of a lake and thrown a rock into the lake. When you do that, you can see something very funny happens. It's, it's represented on the picture on the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, you can see little waves forming at the surface of the water. Well, electromagnetic waves are very similar to that process, except that you cannot see them. Um, so the difference between the waves at the surface of the water and electromagnetic waves is that wave uh, carry energy in a different form and they travel through empty space or through air and they travel at the speed of light. So they go very fast. And we characterize these waves by something that we call their wavelength. So you can see that there are different waves uh, represented on the left uh, hand side of the slide. And the distance between two of these waves is called the wavelength. So the closer uh, these waves, the shorter the wavelength. We do the same description for electromagnetic waves and we characterize them or rename them as a function of their wavelength, the distance between two successive waves. So let's take a look at all the different waves that um, that exist in uh, in um, in in our um, environments. So the ones with the longest wavelength, about a thousand meters, are called radio wave. So here uh, we use these to transmit uh, data uh, for radio. So this is what allows you to listen to the radio. Now, if we go to wavelengths that are a little bit shorter uh, on the order of centimeters, this is what we call microwaves. This is the same thing as uh, waves that you use to heat your lunch when you want uh, to, to have lunch. If you go even smaller, uh, to, to much smaller wavelength, uh, this is what we call infrared. So uh, this is about the size of a, of a, of a needle. And uh, infrared is a radiation that's emitted by the human body. So there's a lot of uh, apparatus uh, that, uh, you, that are used in the military uh, in the form of infrared camera because it allows you to see the infrared radiation emitted by uh, human bodies. If you go even smaller, um, where the wavelength is about the size of a big bacteria, we are in what we call the visible range of the spe electromagnetic spectrum. This is the only part that the human eye can see. The other uh, forms of radiation, we cannot see them. Let's go even smaller. If uh, we get to much smaller wavelength, where the wavelength is about the size of a very big molecule, we are in the ultraviolet range of the electromagnetic spectrum. 
And uh, UVs are uh, very present. Uh, this is what causes sunburn. And fortunately, we have our ozone layer uh, at the top of the atmosphere that allows us to get protected from these UV rays. But there are still some that pass through and that can cause a sunburn. If we go even smaller, if the wavelength is about the size of an atom, remember how small I uh, described atoms earlier, this is what we call X-rays. So X-rays have an extremely short wavelength. And because they have an extremely short wavelength, they carry a lot of energy and they have sufficient energy to penetrate through the body and, and go through the soft tissue and your skin in your body. And if we go even to shorter wavelength, uh, it exists. This is what we call gamma rays. Gamma rays is the radiation that carries the most energy of all of these. So because X-rays have uh, a lot of energy and carry a lot of energy that penetrate through different objects, and we use these X-rays to make um, images. And this is exactly uh, what you, you probably um, uh, have seen at the doctor's office. Uh, because X-rays go, go through the skin and through the body, they can look at your bones. So it's very useful to see if a bone has been broken. They're not only used for that, but for example, at the airport, when you put your uh, luggage through, um, through security, well, x-rays are used to look through your suitcase. So it goes through the soft tissue of your suitcase to see what's inside. And you can see on this picture, somebody has a nice bottle of wine uh, or water hidden in the suitcase. And then finally, on the right hand side, this is a remote control, like a standard TV remote control. So x-rays can go through the plastic of the remote control and see what's inside the remote control. So this is very useful in industry to do detailed imaging of uh, circuits or computer parts or any parts that is being manufactured. So x-rays are really cool, very useful and, and used in a lot of uh, cases. So that's why we're so interested in, uh, in working with x-rays and trying to make new and better x-ray sources in the research that we are doing at Livermore. So how do we make x-rays with our particle accelerator? Uh, there are several ways to do this, but I'll show you one way um, that is directly related to the research that we do at Livermore. So, a particle that you have uh, accelerated to the speed of light in your accelerator, if it's going straight, it just will keep going. But if you make the particle change direction, it's going to emit radiation along its path. Why is it doing that? Because when the particle turns, it loses a little bit of its energy. It slows down. And when it does that, it gives away its extra energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. And remember, electromagnetic radiation, is, uh, it carries energy. So when the particle turns, it will emit radiation along its path. And I'll explain you in the next few slides why this radiation is X-rays. So how do we do in a particle accelerator to force the particle to change its path? Normally it's going straight. I showed you in the video earlier, but if you put magnets around that particle and uh, arrange them in a, in a specific order, you will be able to attract with a magnetic field, the particle in a different direction. So you first start attracting upwards and then down and then up and then down and so on so that the particle will oscillate uh, by in this magnetic field and when that particle oscillates each time it's making a turn it's going to emit x-rays so we use magnets in a particle accelerator to change the particle path so that the particle will emit x-rays all right, now I'll go into explaining why these are X-rays and not a different type of radiation. So normally a particle, when it emits radiation, 
it's emitting radiation at the wavelength, so the separation between two crests of the wave, uh, similar to the size of the motion of the particle. So let's take a look at our magnets. Typically, a magnet is something that's a centimeter size, so it, it's something that I could hold in my hand. And so the wavelength uh, or the oscillation motion uh, of this electron uh, trajectory is going to be on that same order, so about a centimeter. If we go back to the graph that we had earlier, um, this doesn't correspond to the X-ray wavelength at all. This is more like in the microwave range. So how come that an electron that has a trajectory like this can emit X-rays? Well, to try to understand that and how an electron doing this motion can emit X-rays, uh, we'll need some help from one of our most uh, famous physicists. And you've probably all heard from him. His name is Albert Einstein. And um, last century, he came up with a very clever theory uh, called special theory of relativity. So let me try to explain how the special theory of relativity can explain why we're making x-rays in our accelerator. So what does it tell us? Um, it tells us that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. But when you get closer to the speed of light, like your particle does in your particle accelerator, some funny things will start to happen. So here is a police officer that could be in the street of Livermore. And on my free time, when I uh, can go outside, um, I like to bike, I like to be on my bike. So let's say that one of these days I was really fast and I was going to about the speed of light on my bike. I was a very strong cyclist. Well, special theory of relativity tells us that the police officer who is going to look at me going at the speed of light, light is going to see me like this. I'm going to be shrunk. This is an effect of relativity. If you look at something that's going at the speed of light, it's going to appear shrunk. But this theory also tells us that everything is relative. And me on my bike, I'll just feel normal. I won't look shrunk at all. But I will see the police officer shrunk. So he will see me shrunk and I'll see him shrunk. So this is what this theory is telling us. And so how does it apply to our particle accelerator? Let's come back to our electron wiggling in the magnets. So this is what we see. If you were in the laboratory and we're looking at your electron um, oscillating, this is what we would see. But because the electron is going at the speed of light, it's going to see shrunk magnets and that's about a 10,000 that's about 10,000 times smaller that's about shrunk by a, t a factor of 10,000 and we're almost there so we've shrunk our wavelength a little bit but not quite x-rays yet so if we take the trajectory the electron sees this but for us who we are in the lab and we see an electron go by at the speed of light, we're gonna see also something 10,000 sm times smaller. And we're there. So this uh, explains how we're seeing X-rays and how we can make X-rays with a big machine uh, that makes electrons oscillate in a magnet. So this is something that's very hard to understand. And even for us scientists, because we, Going to the speed of light is not something that we do in our everyday life. And so um, I hope that I was able to walk you through that, but don't hesitate to ask me questions at the end. Uh, but this is a very, uh, a very interesting feature that explains how we can make x-rays in a particle accelerator. All right, so now that I've showed you how we make x-rays with these particle accelerators, 
I'm going to show you examples of these particle accelerators. So machines that make X-rays in this uh, in this way are called synchrotrons or free electron lasers. And at the bottom, I have two pictures showing uh, one of each. On the left hand side, this is what we call a synchrotron. So it produces X-rays by making particles circle around in a big circle, and then you send them through the magnets and they emit X-rays. A free electron laser, on the other hand, uh, you make the particle go straight in a particle accelerator, just like the one I've showed earlier in the video. And they oscillate uh, in magnets as well to produce X-rays. And they're very useful for a lot of scientific applications. And I'll show you a bunch of them. So, for example, X-rays are very useful because as I said earlier, they have very small wavelength. And these wavelengths are small enough to look at molecules and atoms because the wavelength is the size of the molecule and the atoms. So one thing that you can look at, for example, is a process where uh, atoms assemble together to produce water molecules. So for to make a water molecule, you need two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, and when they assemble, they form a water molecule. So X-rays are sm have small enough wavelengths to allow you to look at these atoms and molecules assembling. There is one problem though. This process happens extremely quickly. It happens over the course of 10 femtoseconds. So what is a femtosecond? That's a name that I hadn't heard before I started doing research uh, as an undergraduate student. So one femtosecond is one quadrillionth of a second. So that's extremely, extremely short. And to give you an idea of how short a femtosecond is, it is to a minute what a minute is to the age of the universe. And the universe is about 14 billion years old. So, or in another word, in one second, light, if you were traveling at the speed of light, in one second, you would almost have time to go all the way from the Earth to the Moon. In one femtosecond, if you were also traveling at the speed of light, you barely would have time to cross, to cross the width of one of my hair. So a femtosecond is about as short as you can be, as you can go. All right. And so why do we need femtoseconds to look at molecules assembling themselves? Well, let's try to take an example. If you are trying to take a picture of someone running, if you want to take a quick snapshot and have a very crisp picture of that person running, you need to do a very fast opening of your, of your shutter uh, camera, of your camera shutter. If you leave your shutter open for too long, then the runner uh, you're trying to take a picture of is going to appear completely blurry, like at the bottom right of my um, little picture here. So, for X-rays, it is the same. We need X-rays that are femtosecond flashes in order to take pictures and make movies of molecules assembling themselves. And these little, um, these big machines that I told you about earlier, synchrotrons and X-ray free electron lasers, they're very cool. They have allowed a lot of scientific discoveries but uh, they're very big, so it's really hard to get access to these sources if you want to do an experiment. And uh, they have several things that they could do better on. So um, these machines have the synchrotrons. They have several X-ray wavelengths, so you can have different types of X-rays, which is great. But they're very slow. They don't produce fast pulses, so that's kind of hard to do movies of molecules assembling themselves. The other machine I, I talked about, the X-ray free electron laser, um, 
it produces very fast x-rays so you can make these movies of molecules assembling themselves but they only produce one x-ray wavelength at a time which is very good for some applications but not as good for others so how about if we could make an x-ray source that could fit in your garage that uh, produces fast pulses and that has many wavelengths so that you have different types of x-rays and that's what we're trying to do with our experiment so let me see how i can explain how we can make particles uh, accelerators on a much smaller scale so for that we use lasers and we use plasmas to do something that we call laser wake field acceleration so I'll walk you through all of these words in my next few slides. On the left hand side, this is a regular particle accelerator, like the one at uh, SLAC in, um, in the south of, uh, of the bay. It's about three kilometers in length, in length. it's uh, two miles. And then on the right hand side, this is a laser plasma accelerator. Um, I'm standing in the picture with my colleague, Brad Pollock, and we try to uh, do an experiment. And so this is about a meter long. So you could have this in your garage. And the reason is the electrical field that pushes the particles all the way uh, to accelerate them to the speed of light is about a thousand times stronger in a laser plasma accelerator than in a regular particle accelerator. All right. So I've talked about laser plasmas and um, wake field accelerators. So I'll explain all of these things um, to you in my next few, few slides. So what is a laser? Uh, lasers are very cool. We have a lot of them at Livermore and, it is, and, and it's something that's used in a lot of um, different scenarios and in a lot of different things. It's not only used in scientific, science fiction movies, but it's used in, in a lot of uh, everyday life applications. It's used in industry to cut through things. It is used in a um, uh, grocery store to scan for your price uh, of items. Uh, it's used for doing presentations, uh, laser pointers. And laser is actually not a word. It's, a, it's an acronym. So it stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So what does that mean? So if you take a light bulb and you light up that light bulb, it's white light. Uh, so it produces many colors at once. And wherever you position yourself with respect to that light bulb, uh, it produces radiation all over the place, wherever you look at. On the other hand, if you take a laser, it only has one color. So that's a laser. I have a laser pointer in my hand. And it only emits in one direction. So you can see I'm holding a piece of paper. I don't know if it's easy to see on the camera. You see I have a little red dot here. So the laser points all its energy, all its light in only one direction. So we're gonna just take a little break. Um, I, if you are at home and are looking at this presentation with, uh, with your parents, um, if you're with friends, uh, well, not, 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 not with friends because you can do that now, but uh, the next time you'll be able to do that. So um, I want you to clap all together and just clap, 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 clap and um, see how messy it is when you clap all together in a, in a completely um, random uh, fashion. If you start to clap all together in unison and you're synchronized, you'll see that you'll make a lot more noise. This is exactly what the laser does with electromagnetic ra radiation. It puts all the waves that it produces in phase and synchronizes them so that it produces a lot more energy. That's why lasers are so powerful and, uh, and, and unique. So we talked about lasers. Now let's talk about a plasma. So earlier in the presentation, I talked about atoms. Atoms has particles, 
positive particles in the center and um, it has uh, electrons, so negative charged particles gravitating around. These particles in a regular atom, they're bound together by a very strong force and it's really hard to pull them apart. However, a laser, because it's so powerful, uh, can separate these electrons from the ions and form a plasma. So when you shoot a laser onto material, you're going to have enough energy to rip apart the electrons from the nuclei. And you're going to be left with, with free electrons moving around and ions. So these are the, the remainder of the nuclei um, that are positively charged also moving around. And we call that a plasma. It's basically a collection of atoms where everything has been pulled apart. We call that a plasma. And we do a lot of plasma research at Livermore. So to give you an idea, in a plasma, we have ions, so the positively charged particles together, and we have electrons, the negatively charged particles together. And typically, because electrons are so much more heavier than uh, ions, they're going to move around a lot easier. It's kind of like comparing bowling balls to ping pong balls. So if you put bowling balls on the floor and then you put ping pong balls on the floor and you try to blow them, um, probably the bowling ball, unless you blow very, very strongly, they're not going to move, whereas the electrons are just going to be able to fly all the way around. So, and that's something that we use to do a laser plasma accelerator. So, how can we create a particle accelerator using lasers and using plasmas? Well, we're going to create something first that's called an electron plasma wave. So you've probably all seen, uh, if you look at a boat and if it goes onto a lake, at the back of the boat, there is a, a, a lot of white uh, stuff. So the boat creates what we call a wake. It basically does that because it pushes the water as it advances, and then it leaves this white wake at the back. Well, a laser will do exactly the same thing in the plasma, except that it's not pushing water, it's going to push electron. And on the, le on the right hand side, this is exactly the same phenomenon, except that it's, uh, it's happening on a much smaller scale, uh, about the width of a human hair. Uh, and so the laser that's represented in green, uh, when it moves through a plasma, it's able to push the electrons around itself and form this wake at the back of uh, the laser. So the laser is in uh, green and the electrons are in blue. And the different shades of blue re represent more or less electrons, a different density of electrons. So the laser is able to push the electrons around to create a wave similar to what a wake uh, would be behind the boat. And this is actually a very powerful computer simulation of a laser uh, plasma wave. Uh, an electron plasma wave that was done by one of my Livermore colleagues, Nuno Lemos. And so not only we do experiments, but we do also uh, cool simulations of these phenomena um, to be able to explain them. All right. So now we've been able to create an electron plasma wave using a laser, using a plasma. How are we going to accelerate electrons in this plasma wave? Yes, we're going to make them surf. All right. So if you're able to put your electron at the right position in the wave, you'll be able to have the electron gain speed and you'll be able to accelerate the electron and you'll have created a miniature particle accelerator. So this is a process that's, um, that's been first proposed in 1979. And since then, scientists have tirelessly worked on experiments using lasers and plasmas 
to try to make the best miniature particle accelerators. And so if you create your electron plasma wave and you put electrons in them behind your laser pulse, this is image A, uh, the wave at some point breaks and the electrons that are part of this wave breaking, they can surf the remainder of the wave. And when they surf the remainder of the wave, they gain velocity and they accelerate and uh, can be uh, accelerated just like they would in a regular particle accelerator, except that it's happening on a much smaller times, uh, scale and distance than in a regular particle accelerator. So just like surfing, electrons that will be trapped in your plasma wave will need to be very well synchronized with the plasma wave. So I'll show you an example of excellent synchronization in a, in a very strong plasma wave and a not so good example of synchronization uh, in a not so very good uh, plasma wave. So let's take a look at this one. All of these surfers that you see here are electrons. And you can see that one of them paddled hard enough to be at the right place in the wave and just accelerates to very high velocity and gain a lot of velocity. So that's one good particle right here. Okay, however, this is something that's very hard to do, right? It requires a lot of pedaling. So same thing in laser wave field acceleration, uh, scientists are tirelessly working to find new methods um, and clever methods to trap these particles and make them accelerate uh, to, the, to the right speed. So here, that's another example, but it's not so good. Um, so I, when I moved uh, from France to California, I tried to learn surfing. And um, at first, this was quite a struggle. And so this is basically what happens if you have a not so synchronized electron with your electron plasma wave. So if the electron is not doing anything, see, it's not going to get trapped. It's not going to catch the wave. Now, if the electron tries to make a little effort or if we help the electron make some effort, finally, yes, yes, yes. Okay, but see, the particle hasn't gained as much velocity uh, as in the previous example. So just like surfing, laser wake field acceleration is something that requires a very good and strong electron plasma wave created by a powerful laser and an electron that can be properly trapped into that wave. So you see how we do that. So at Lovermore, we have a lot of cool lasers that we use for uh, these laser wake field acceleration experiments. And these are two of them. Um, on the right hand side, it's, uh, it's, the nice, uh, it's a nice picture of our group. And inside that big machine that you see at the back of the group, uh, this is where we do all of our experimental setup and put our apparatus to do these uh, laser uh, plasma acceleration experiments. All right, I'm almost going to the end of my talk here because there is one last thing we have to talk about is how do we make x-rays with these laser plasma accelerators? Um, and I'll show you how we do that. So earlier in the talk, I said uh, we can make x-rays in a particle accelerator if we force the electrons to change their path. In a regular uh, particle accelerator, we're doing this with magnets. So this is uh, what makes the electrons emit x-rays. But um, in our laser plasma accelerator, we don't have magnets. There is no magnets around. We cannot put them around the plasma accelerator because we cannot make magnets that are that small to have the electrons um, change their path. So what the electrons will do is instead of using magnets, they'll, they'll use the plasma wave itself, they'll use the wave itself to wiggle themselves around. Kind of like this guy is doing um, at the wake uh, in the in the wave created by this boat. So he's wakeboarding and he's like oscillating around uh, to um, by using the strength of the wave uh, to do that. 
And so electrons in a laser plasma accelerator will do, will do just that as well. It will wiggle around in, on top of accelerating. So um, in the front in red, this is your laser pulse, or this was the boat in our example. And then the wake border, if you put him at the right place in the wave, in our case, this will be a trapped electron. Well, it will accelerate in the forward direction and it will also wiggle um, in um, as it's accelerated. And so, as we said earlier, an electron that is being accelerated to the speed of light, but that changes direction at the same time is emitting X-rays. And this is an X-ray source that we have uh, designed at Lovermore, and we're using it for a lot of cool experiments. And we call it Betatron X-ray radiation. And this is an actual picture of what it looks like if we put a camera in front of this uh, nice X-ray beam. And so I showed you the picture earlier with my colleague, and so we can just simply create that by shooting a laser. So it's in red right here. It goes, it bounces around a number of mirrors. And then we focus it onto a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of helium gas. And the laser is powerful. It's gonna rip the uh, electrons out of the atoms of helium gas. And it's going to create the plasma wave uh, that I, I talked about earlier and the electrons uh, that are around can be trapped into that plasma wave, just like a surfer paddles, and they will be accelerated, and they will wiggle at the same time, and they will produce the X-rays. And so we've just created um, one of the smallest X-ray uh, sources uh, that we can uh, possibly uh, have. All right, so We've, uh, we've just uh, said that we can produce X-rays using a process called laser wake field acceleration. And the X-rays that are produced this way are just like the big machines, but it's on a much smaller scale. So remember, we've got synchrotrons, we've got free electron lasers. They use magnets to make electrons wiggle uh, and emit X-rays. And we've just created something called a laser wake field accelerators, where we use lasers, we use plasmas that are created with the laser. And in this machine, electrons can wiggle and be accelerated also at the same time and produce X-rays. So we've just created a miniature X-ray source. And I told you earlier that Synchrotrons produced a lot of different X-ray wavelengths, but they're slow. You cannot make movies of molecules moving around um, with a high precision. X-ray free electron lasers, on the other hand, are fast, but they are only producing one wavelength um, at, the, at a time. And then finally, laser wave field accelerators, and they still need some work to be perfected, of course, they will not replace synchrotrons or free electron lasers anytime soon, but they have the potential to produce several different X-ray wavelengths at a time, and they're very fast pulses that, allows, that allow you to take snapshots of uh, molecules moving around and other phenomena like so I'll go to some applications, and I think then we'll wrap up. So one application is to use these X-rays for radiographing objects. So regular X-rays, you can use them to radiograph um, your hand, for example, and you can see the bones. But the X-rays that we're producing with these laser wake field accelerators are unique and they will allow you to take radiography of biological objects with a very, very fine precision. On the left-hand side, this is an example of a radiograph taken with uh, one of these miniature sources. And this is a radiograph of a, of a cricket. And you can see all the fine structures uh, of that cricket. So it's very powerful to get very precise images of uh, objects. On the right-hand side, 
This is a sample of hip bone that was also radiographed with uh, one of these sources. And you can see the fine details uh, of the bone structures. And so that will allow you to, um, to for example, diagnose uh, diseases in, in bones that you wouldn't be able to look at with other X-ray sources. One of the things that we use them for is something called absorption spectroscopy. So we produce a source that has many wavelengths. And so when you send X-rays through a sample, like a piece of aluminum or water or anything, if you put them in and then you look at their spectrum, so the intensity versus the wavelength, the spectrum has changed. And the way the spectrum changes tells you a lot about the structure and the composition of the material. We can also use these x-rays for something that we call the fraction. So when we have big proteins or big crystals, these have a particular structure. It's a periodic arrangement of things. And if you send x-rays onto such samples, then they will diffract. They will just scatter all around. And the way they do this tells us a lot about the structure of that uh, sample. It tells us how proteins are arranged. It tells us how crystals are arranged uh, and things like that. And the reason we like to have these fast X-ray pulses to look at molecules and elements assembling themselves is to do something that we call pump probe experiments. So I told you earlier, if you put X-rays through a sample and you look at them out after they've come out of that sample, they will look different. Now, if we try to take a powerful laser, like the ones that we have at the lab, and try to just smack that sample with a lot of laser energy. So we create a shock or we make that sample very hot. And if we send X-rays through that sample that has been smacked with the laser, well, the X-rays that will be absorbed by that sample are very different than the X-rays that will be absorbed by the sample before it was shocked. So by looking at the X-rays at different times like this, we can create a movie of how shocking that material or heating that material uh, has influenced the sample, if it has changed its its composition or its structure. And X-rays are an extremely powerful tool for us to do that. So X-rays that are fast, uh, that have many wavelengths, and that can produce in a small be produced in a small machine are powerful because they allow us to look at what you cannot see with the human eye. And so that's nearing the end of my talk. So what have we learned today? I hope um, we've learned that uh, particle accelerators are very cool machines and we've learned how they work. Uh, we've learned that we can make x-rays with these. Uh, we've learned that we can make miniature particle accelerators using lasers and plasmas. And we call them laser wake field accelerators. We can make x-rays with laser wake field accelerators. And the x-rays that we're making with these laser wake field accelerators are enabling very cool applications that scientists um, like those at Livermore Lab uh, like to look at. And if this is research that interests you, um, so <clears throat> there is a lot of fields that can be um, impacted uh, by these uh, X-ray sources. So same as for a regular uh, particle accelerator, it can solve a lot of problems in fundamental discovery, medical applications for imaging, uh, industry uh, also for imaging and, and a number of other things, or national security by looking at uh, what's inside cargo containers or luggage. And so Livermore has a lot of lasers, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, 
But there's a lot of these high intensity lasers in the world that allow you to do that research. And so this is a very, very vibrant and cool area of research. And I hope that today um, I've uh, allowed you to get a little glimpse at it and that um, this is something that you would find interesting as well. And so with that, you've probably seen during the presentation that I won't be able to help you with uh, your surfing skills, but I will be happy to answer any physics questions if you have any. All right. Thank you, everybody, and um, I hope you're all staying safe and healthy um, during this time. And uh, on to questions now. Thank you very much, Felici. That was very nice. Um, so we are going to take questions now. Um, in case you don't know, you can ask yeah. a question through the chat feature by uh, wiggling your, your mouse. And towards the bottom, there should be a text bubble, and you can type your question in and I will read them one at a time uh, for Felice to answer. And already yeah. people have answered, asked some questions. So one of them was, what is a particle? Yes, uh... <laughs> so I think um, if that question was answered, um, asked before I showed earlier, so um, so there, there are different types of particles, but particles are what's part of an atom. And an atom is what uh, constitutes um, elements. So if you take the elements, um, we have elements is what constitute matter around us. So we have, uh, for example, in the air, we have element oxygen, we have the element nitrogen. In water, we have element oxygen, or we have the element hydrogen. If you take a look at these elements individually, the smallest form that can retain the properties of these elements is called an atom. And an atom is a collection of particles that are arranged in a, in a specific way. And there are positively charged particles inside that atom that are part of the nucleus of the atom. And around that nucleus, you have negatively charged particles. They're called the electrons. And so these are uh, where we get particles to make particle accelerators. That answered the question. So somebody else uh, asked, how are lasers made? Oh, there are different ways to make lasers. Um, OK, so I'll give you an example um, of, um, of, of typical lasers. So. It's an acronym and it stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So um, all of these words mean something important here. So in a laser, you have, if you have a, a, a material and you bring that material, so let's say some types of glass have that property. If you bring a lot of energy to that material, uh, you can put that material into an excited state, which means that the material that you put into that excited state won't stay in that state for a very long time. So it's going to just relax back to a normal state. And you can bring energy to that material to put it into an excited state, either with uh, other light or with uh, electricity. So you put the material into an excited state and it's going to relax back to a normal state. When it does that, it loses energy in the process and it loses energy in the form of light. So normally it just, you know, sends light all over the place. Now, if you put mirrors around that material that you put into an excited state, some of that light is going to bounce off of the mirrors and is going to come back through that material. If you don't do anything to that material, when the light comes back through it, not, not much is going to happen. But if you put again your material through an excited state and you synchronize that with when the light is coming back through that material that has bounced back from the rear, it's going to grab another light particle, we call that a photon, that is going, that is going to have the same properties as the one uh, that's um, 
that's coming through the material. And then you're going to have two of these guys coming out. They're going to bounce around the mirror and you're going to re-put your material into an excited state. And instead of having two, you're going to have four coming out and so on and so forth. And at some point, you're going to have so much light that you're going to have created a lot of power. And one of these mirrors, so they're not, one of these mirrors, not completely 100% reflecting. It lets some of the light go out. And so that's how, that's one way we can make lasers. So we amplify the light. That's why it's called light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And we stimulate that radiation by uh, exciting the material. So there's a question from Bay. Um, how does the brilliance of the X-ray beam generated like this compare to synchrotron linear accelerators? So <clears throat> there's different ways um, to characterize brilliance. There is the average brilliance, so the brilliance over a long period of time, or the peak brilliance, which is uh, the instantaneous um, light. So the peak brilliance roughly compares with uh, the peak brilliance of a synchrotron. It's uh, because the X-rays that we produce in, the, in our sources are extremely short. It's extremely short. So it's on the same order as, uh, as a synchrotron, um, like the synchrotron at Berkeley Labs. It's not yet the peak brilliance of a free electron laser. These are still the, the most uh, brilliant X-ray sources that you can produce. Um, we're still we're working toward making uh, the plasma sources better, but they haven't yet reached the peak brilliance of a free electron laser. So Bob Heater asked, can you make gamma rays with this technology? Hi, Bob. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> we, OK, the beta -tron source that I presented, um, the X-ray wavelength um, depends on the oscillation period of your electron, so, and also depends on the electron energy. So in theory, there is nothing that precludes you from, from doing gamma rays with that. Um, if you could accelerate electrons to high enough energies, um, it scales with about the, with the square of the, of the electron energy. Uh, you could potentially reach uh, MEV, MEV ranges. Uh, yes, there is not, nothing that, um, that prevents you from doing that. Um, if you want to do gamma rays, though, there is another process uh, that we use um, that we call Compton scattering. And we force the electrons, instead of having the electrons wiggle in the plasma wave, we force the electrons to wiggle in a second laser field. And um, that allows them to oscillate, um, <clears throat> that allows them to oscillate in, uh, in the laser field and um, in, with a much shorter period, and then they can produce gamma rays. So yes. Uh, short answer, yes, we can do gamma rays. Uh, so somebody asked, where will the recording be available? And I will send the link right now uh, to everybody. Um, okay. Right now, if you want to peruse uh, previous seminars that have been given, these were actually uh, research talks given by scientists from all over the country and the world. <clears throat> um, and also you can explore our website uh, through the links there and see different opportunities at Livermore. Um, so please check it out. Um, and I'm not sure exactly when the this video will be available there, um, hopefully soon, um, but it might take a while for us to get go through the laboratory's release process and everything. Um, <clears throat> so uh, how many atoms make a molecule? So, um, so I said, so in, if you take to get it, um, so it, it really depends on a, on a molecule. Um, if you have um, a water molecule, it's uh, two hydrogen atoms and then uh, one oxygen atom, H2O. So that, that depends on the molecule. Uh, there's molecules that have a lot more atoms than other, but the one, a simple molecule like water has three. 
Vasily Gecko uh, asks, what are the means of control of the properties of betatron radiation? In particular, how does the intensity, spectrum, and angle diagram of the radiation depend on plasma density and A0, which is equal to QA over MC squared? Oh, wow. So that's a, that's a more technical question. So I'm happy uh, to, to discuss this with you offline, of course, if you want, but um, I'll, I'll quickly answer. So A0, this is a parameter that we use for, for those uh, around who are not uh, familiar with that. Uh, to characterize the intensity of our laser pulse. So the energy of the electrons and thus uh, the energies of our X-rays are going to increase if we increase that um, laser intensity. Uh, with electron density, we can change a lot of things too, but it's something that you, it's hard in a laser plasma accelerator, you cannot change things individually without at some point um, harming your process. So if you increase your electron density, for example, you will have more electrons, so you will produce more X-rays, but you will also at some point decrease your energy, uh, your electron energy and your X-ray energy. So that's not something that's, that's ideal. Um, ideally, to increase the energy of your electrons, you need to decrease the electron density in your plasma. But at the same time, to still maintain the efficiency of the process, you need to increase uh, the power of your laser. So a lot of things are, are like hard to decouple uh, among, among themselves. So I think that uh, is all the questions. Um, if okay. somebody wants to take one right now. Um, well, thank you everybody for um, joining us today. Uh, I got it was very exciting for me to do this. I hope you learned something out of it, and um, you know you can always contact us through the center website if you have any questions. Um, and I hope you all stay safe and healthy at home. And uh, yeah, and uh, I have to say I have some of my French family who joined us today. So I'm I'm doubly excited. <laughs> Well, thank you again, Felicity, and thank you to everyone for joining us, and we hope you had a good time. <laughs>